Beth Lowe um, works in a, a variety of materials and her figures, although look appear to be childlike and cute, they certainly talk about many of the stereotypes that Chinese Americans have today. So that's what those balloons are above their heads, I guess. Yes, they're thought bubbles. Oh. And so the figures to from the far left are children. One is represented by um, a mortarboard, someone who has graduated college over at Harvard, and then moving to the right, you'll, you'll see more traditional occupations such as uh, Chinese cooks, the whole gamut, I guess, of it, employment. It does run the gamut, and she does like to kind of share that imagery, those ideas with the public in a um, humorous way. We're at the Ruth Williamson Gallery in Claremont, California, for another edition of Out and About with Roger Martin. Well, we're at the Ruth Chandler Williams Gallery in Claremont, California, and we're here at the 78th Ceramic Annual. It's the oldest ceramic annual in the United States, and it's an exhibition that's featuring artists that use text and clay. I'm sorry, they use what and clay? Text, words in their clay. Oh. So they're all very social and political statements, issues about climate, about uh, gender, um, about abuse, it's a wide variety, a very diverse group of artists. We relocated around the country. We have an artist from Texas, Canada, San Francisco, Denmark. It's a large, interesting, and diverse group. So it's not just California? No, not at all. Every year, the exhibition is curated by an educator and artist. They make the choices of the artist, and we facilitate their interest and their curatorial point of view and we bring artists from around the country and in many cases from outside of the United States. The theme of this year's 78th Ceramic Annual is rich with social and political commentary, touching down on serious issues like gun control, a woman's right to choose, and the turbulent state of race relations. The notion of blending these ceramic works with the power of the written word makes for a vibrant and sobering collection that exceeds the boundaries of socio-political commentary. Nancy's a Bay Area artist, and she has been working with um, clay and text for many, many years. This particular show um, is a first for her in that she has taken kind of the familiar object of a cup um, and has paired it with a watercolor that um, in both cases have text. She's taken the text um, straight out of magazines, or newspaper articles, radio, um, TV, and they're just fragments of conversations. It's as if you were sitting in a cafe and you just heard 
the the middle part of a conversation, not the front or the back. And it, and and it becomes your responsibility to what you do with that information. So as you go around reading the cups and the teapots, you'll you'll notice that they're hard to read, they're hard to decipher. You can make out certain words, certain ideas, certain thoughts, but it becomes your responsibility to put it together. And I think it's a commentary on all of us with the age of, of internet that we, we tend to think that anything we read is truth, but the, um, the, the truth of the matter is it isn't. It's just partially true, and it becomes our duty, really, to do due diligence and do research and listen and talk and have a conversation so that we really do fully understand the meaning of any given piece or any given conversation um, that we that is part of our life. We actually have 60 tea bowls and 60 watercolors um, in the exhibition and again each of them have particular comments that she has silk screened onto them so then in the firing they start to blend together hard to read, hard to understand, um, but still, part, you, you will recognize the language, you'll recognize the subject matter, and it's her effort or her hope that you will pay attention to not only the conversation, but the words that are used in those conversations, because that's what empowers any of our, um, it gives it meaning and I think it's about meaning and it's about what we do with that um, that becomes important to Nancy's work. Other entries in the exhibition reflect a similar theme to Nancy's work as bowls and plates encompass many of the pieces. Canadian artist Judy Chartrand's works reflect the culture and sensitivity of the First Nations people, touching down on issues like social inequity, racism and poverty. These works are deeply personal to her, especially since she is Manitoba Cree. And Keiko Fukuzawa's politically charged perception plates encompass the Ishihara color blindness test, challenging the viewer to decipher cryptic words hidden within the ceramic pieces. I appropriated and I recontextualized eye doctor called Ishihara uh, colorblind plate or people called perception plate. Um, I learned the simple number like 74 should be clearly visible to viewers with normal vision. However, the viewers with Dichromacy or trichromacy may see it as 21 instead of 74. And the viewers to monochromacy may see nothing. So it depends on viewers, the subject matters altered. And instead of numbers, I use the word such as January 6, power or gun. Um, because as the same words um, has a different meaning depends on the viewers or context. The pieces encompassing the Perception Plates collection are unique in their colors and patterns, but each contains a unique message reflecting the hot-button issues that drive today's political discourse. How long does it take for you to gather all these people together and know that they're going to be here like today? <laughs> we start about a year and a half um, because we one that we want to develop uh, the curatorial point of view. We need to discuss with the artists their particular needs. There's of course shipping and all the arrangements of installation, and so it's about a year and a half. And in addition, we do produce a catalog, so we need to start six months ahead gathering all the catalog materials. 
So this is part of the college, I believe. It is, yes. Yeah. Now, when these people all gather here, uh, for what period of time is that? And uh, this is, what, every, every year? Every year. So you're kind of busy, aren't you? We're busy. It's uh, like painting the Golden Gate Bridge. You know, as soon as you finish up, you're starting on the next um, annual. And so it keeps us busy. Every year is different. This is my 35th year of being involved in the ceramic annual. Um, and I can tell you, uh, they're all very different. And what makes it exciting for not only the staff here at the gallery, but also for the audience that comes every year to see the show. When we return, we'll explore another of Keiko's powerful works that exposes America's gun culture and the sheer magnitude of how many people die from gun violence in a single week. And we'll meet an artist who envisions language as an abstract skin and witness words collapse under their own weight when Out and About continues. Kirk, before we go any further, I've got to ask you about that typewriter because I had one like it, but it, this, this is one is a little different from what this, I had. This is uh, certainly very different. Um, this was an iconic work by Robert Arneson. It was done in 1965. And Robert Arneson was kind of the founder of the funk movement here in California that looked at artwork and ideas in a satirical, a scatological, humorous way, but underneath are very strong, important social commentaries. So the typewriter, if you notice, the keys are women's fingernails, polished red. Um, when they were first shown in 67, um, it really created quite a fur um, amongst the um, art you know, aficionados. Um, it's satirical, but it's also the commentary on um, the stereotypic sexy secretary. And um, the use of the fingernails kind of represent the, the women in the workplace. And it was a commentary on the fact that we stereotypically put women in positions of... Well, I object here because okay, I okay. I use that typewriter and I'm a male. Yes, you and, are. And uh, I, I guess you could have put some male fingernails on there. True, but um, if you remember in the 1960s, you know, the men were in higher positions in power, although most of the workforce was made up of women um, taking care of all the serious business. And so this certainly is commenting on and of the discrepancy between the men and women in the workforce in the United States in the 60s. Continuing out and about's coverage of the 78th Ceramic Annual, we find ourselves at the Ruth Chandler Williamson Gallery in Claremont, California. This year's theme is Handle Carefully, The Power of Words and Clay, and the visions of the ten artists featured represent a dynamic fusion of art and language, transcending the notions and expectations of the artistic experience. My artwork is interested in kind of ephemeral and kind of these tra transitory ideas and kind of things that move through kind of time. And this work, I use language to explore those ideas and kind of the ephemeral nature of language itself, right? So language isn't a thing, right? It's, it's this, this, this tool that we use to communicate with one another. Um, but I'm interested in kind of the immateriality of language. Uh, well, I, I understand the phrase there, but there's a, a P lying down and there's a T all scrunched up. What, what happened there? Um, so when I started to conceive of this work, right, so like be before I started making this body of work that's in the show, which I started about 10 years ago, my, my work was really very high concept work, installation based, time based, again, very ephemeral work. And it was again about this, this, this um, uh, ephemeralness, right, stuff that kind of slips away. Um, and then I was doing a res an artist residency in the Netherlands about 10 years ago. And the residency, there's people from all over the world. Um, Holland is a very international country space. 
and I ask myself the question, what's more ephemeral than language itself, right? Again, it's not a thing, right? E even even written, written words is not a thing, right? It's a symbol for something else. And so I ask myself, well, how can I make work about that? And so kind of my first answer to the question is I have to give language material so I can talk about its immateriality, right? I gotta make it something to talk about nothing, in other words. And, and when I first started doing this, I made them out of paper. It just it was the material I had so I could start to conceptualize what they would look like. And just intuitively, I started to color the inside of them, right? And through the spaces between the paper, you could see these colors bleeding through. And then I realized, you know, I come out of ceramics, I have degrees in ceramics, and I realized ceramics, particularly mold making and slip casting, would be a perfect um, process for this material because I can make a mold for every letter in the alphabet, right? And then I can repeatedly cast them. I can, and then therefore, uh, and it would, because of the nature of slip casting, it leaves an empty space on the inside that's untouched by my fingers, right? I, I wanted to remove my, my touch from it. And then by making it in ceramic, it gives it not only materiality, um, but it's still fragile. And as I was thinking about this work, poetically or conceptually, kind of my core idea would be, you know, you conceive of an idea in your mind as an abstraction. You skin it with language, and then it goes into your mind, and it becomes an abstraction again. And I wanted to make work that was both of those things at the same time. And when I made these and started setting them up, I pulled language into space, I gave it material, but I didn't account for gravity, right? And so wherever the letters would sit, they would, if they, they couldn't hold themselves up, they, the R would lean into the E, or the P would kind of lean over. Or if you look at these, the dots just drop onto the stem of the eyes, right? So it's kind of this, the gravity's winning in a sense. And a letter that couldn't hold itself up, I would just drop it and let it shatter. And that speaks to these internal spaces of the language, right? So that's well, well perhaps they were a little human-like. Gravity always wins with us too, right? Um, um, and yeah, that has to do, for me, kind of the metaphor extends to just our fragility as well and kind of our dealing with real space and real time. In this piece entitled White Whale, Mueller takes an iconic phrase off the page, transforming it into an abstract three-dimensional entity. So the previous piece that we talked about was, you know, installation-based and kind of taking up more space. Um, and actually during the pandemic, I started to think about um, making more object-based work. In other words, a, a, a thing that can sit on a pedestal and, and kind of be done. And I'm trained in ceramics, and so I started to thinking about the material processes that I could use to articulate some of these poetic or conceptual ideas that we, we had talked about earlier. And, you know, the let's just say the kind of the flowiness or the, the fluid aspects of this piece is just in some way ceramics done wrong. Um, just kind of using some of the, the materiality and, 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 and kind of pushing it to its limits so that the material collapses. Why the title of this uh, piece? It's such an iconic phrase in Western culture um, and literary culture and you know, I think it's entered pop culture, safe to say. Um, and, you know, comes with not only visual imagery, um, but also kind of loaded kind of literary tropes and metaphor. Um, and I was interested in taking something that loaded and, and with, that comes with meaning and seeing, and seeing if I could collapse that, right? Collapse the meaning into itself and what else can be pulled from, from those associations and those meanings. Another piece encompasses a word with a thin and permeable skin wrapped around a spoken and written language. When I'm looking for words and phrases, uh, uh, you know, like I said with the previous piece, I'm interested in kind of collapsing those meanings. Um, and so I look for words and phrases that A, you know, kind of f are formally interesting, like how do the letters look together, like just really simple things, but also that you have implications, right? Um, and that imply, and come with meanings, that come with content, and I'm interested in trying to collapse those meanings and trying to collapse those implications. What does that mean, collapse? Kind of um, turn them upside down. Like, what else can this mean, right? And kind of, kind of almost pull the language open and, and see what's holding it up. So it from inside, I suppose. Yeah. So all of these, all the works I've, 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 we've talked about or, or we're showing have internal spaces, right? And like the, the, the bigger, the installation piece, those actually can physically shatter and reveal those spaces. And these, these static objects, there's actually color and glazes on the inside of all these forms. And when I put them through the, the, 
the ceramic processes as they melt and tear, they, the, the skin of the clay tears open and reveals those internal colors. How long have you been involved with ceramics? I got my BFA and my MFA in ceramics of 95 and 2000, respectively. So it's a part of you in a sense. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And it's something, it's something that I've been doing for a long time, but I, I come at the material a little sideways. I don't use it in a traditional way. I went to two schools that were pretty non-traditional in terms of ceramics uh, and pedagogy. Um, and I'm interested in really stretching what the material can do and what it can mean. Danish artist Meta Maya Gregersen's The Skin of the Sea is one of the largest works in the exhibition. The phrases on the 72 porcelain tiles elicit the symbolic importance of the sea and how it is manifest in thoughts and memories. The works of Canadian artist Judy Chartrand include this powerful piece entitled In Memory of Those No Longer With Us to commemorate the lives of missing and murdered indigenous women. In this installation titled Second Sex, artist Elise Pinole uses classic icons of domesticity, like dishes and platters, displaying a delicate and flowery motif with words that lie in sharp contrast to the stereotypical feminine imagery which surrounds them. Catherine Lee has infused her pieces with poetry, and her Raku fired shields are accompanied by the artist's recording. Lives before this invested themselves in shadowy renderings, in cursive disputes, in trials and failings, and successes and proofs, each a will, each a promise, each sputtering on till spent upon one pale gray-green rock perpendicular. And alongside artist Keiko Fukuzawa's controversial perception plates is one of the exhibit's most gut-wrenching entries featuring white porcelain handguns. I wanted to ask you, how many guns do we see here? 900 casted porcelain guns. 900? Yes, 900. So, so there are 900 victims? Correct. I'm addressing America's glaring gun culture and the gun violence problem. I just can't understand it because where I'm from, police officer don't even carry guns in the street of Tokyo. And um, why do Americans um, romanticize guns so much? I just want to know. And then um, I started this project called Peacemaker addressing the maybe too much mass shooting or too many guns on the street. So, so this 900 piece called nine over 365 days. Each porcelain gun contains the name of a victim as well as their age and where they were shot. It is a sobering reminder of the magnitude of gun violence and a powerful tool in spreading public awareness of this uniquely American tragedy. I believe art should be defined its era and reflect what we are living through. So my recent works become more and more political and what is happening in contemporary America politically, socially and culturally. The exciting blend of words and pictures has resulted in an energetic and dynamic display of shapes and images. The exhibition runs through April 2nd and the gallery is open Wednesday through Sunday from 1 to 5. Their admission is free and we welcome all families and friends and college classes. We uh, run tours of the show and we look forward to seeing all of you here. To witness this stunning display of ceramic genius, don't miss, handle carefully, 
The Power of Words and Clay, currently at the Ruth Williamson Gallery at Scripps College in Claremont, California.